Who is the most underrated actor of all time? It's Dolph Lundgren. Correct. Why? Well, because of his uh, spiky hair and yep. his ice cold demeanor and his big muscles. Absolutely. I must predict you. My name is Sergeant Andrew Scott. Come on, guys, don't do this. If I don't get breakfast, I get real grumpy. I don't think you like me grumpy. And you go in pieces, asshole. Let's kick some ass. Hello, and welcome back to I Must Break. This podcast, the fan podcast celebrating the cinematic career of action legend Dolph Lundgren. I'm your host, Sean, and on today's special interview episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with character actor Patrick Kilpatrick. But before we get to the conversation, I wanted to remind you all to please feel free to rate and review the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you go to subscribe. We always appreciate the reviews, especially those five-star reviews. Those always help. Also, please be sure to check out the Last of the Action Heroes podcast network feed, where you can find this show, as well as other podcasts, looking at the careers of fellow action stars, such as Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bruce Willis, and James Bond. You can also check out the Facebook page for the show, I Must Break This Podcast. Here you can stay up to date on the show, the career of Mr. Dolph Lundgren, and other news regarding action cinema in general. So if you're not already following the page, please feel free to like it, share it, and continue being a fan and helping spread the word. Uh, Lastly, if you'd like to get in contact with me with ideas, suggestions, or thoughts on the show in general, you can take a look at the official webpage for the show, which is imustbreakthispodcast.wordpress.com. Now, on to the conversation. Uh, This was an absolute treat and an immense honor, folks. Uh, Recently, I had the privilege of speaking with actor, author, producer, screenwriter, and public speaker, Patrick Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick has an extensive and impressive resume with over 180 acting credits to his name, where he's excelled in a particular niche. Kilpatrick has starred as a villain in quite a few films, and he's had the pleasure of going toe-to-toe with some of the biggest names in the action genre. In fact, Kilpatrick himself says it best, he's been killed, beaten up, or jailed by nearly every actor on both Earth and in outer space. Fans may remember him most as the Sandman from the film Death Warrant, where he menaced Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yet he's also squared off against Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bruce Willis, Dolph Lundgren, Steven Seagal, Tom Cruise, Chow Yun-Fat, and tons of others. Here is just a small sampling of some of Kilpatrick's work over the years, with his roles in Last Man Standing, Death Warrant, Last Stand at Sabre River, Minority Report, Free Willy 3, and the television shows UC Undercover and Babylon 5. It's not a good idea to be looking at Mr. Doyle's girl that way. I remember a guy once told me this is a free country. Jocko, this guy thinks it's a free country. Are you free to go? Sheriff's office is right over there in case you want to complain about anything. The lights out. I thought I made it real clear who you can and can't be looking at around here. That's Mr. Doyle's property. I came here to see you. Yeah? Yeah. You get that car of yours fixed yet? I was wondering if you could maybe help pay the damages. I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. I had two brothers, now I got none. I got a mother in Kansas. You're a good hand, Austin. This morning, Mr. Kiss and three riders headed out to your place. It wasn't social. Why? 
Some fellow rode up to the house last night and pumped two slugs into Dwayne. Killed him for sure. How come you're not with him? Something wrong with this valley. The war's over, but the killing don't stop. I'm thinking you must really like me, don't you, Fletcher? That's why you asked to partner with me on this little sortie, isn't it? I think you're swell company, no? Huh? It's not that you don't trust me to be alone with the chief, is it? But you think I might, you know, futz with him if I had the chance? No, I just want to watch him use your body to sandblast into the building. That's all, Jeff. John Enderton. By mandate of the District of Columbia Pre-Crime Division, I'm placing you under arrest for the murders of Leo Crow and Danny Whitworth. Hey, you made a mistake. What am I supposed to do now? I'm a whaler, that's what I am. Not to me. You're my dad. I want a deal in writing from the U.S. Attorney's Office guaranteeing me and my crew reduced sentences for not killing anybody else. We'll take the weight for Danny. Not a day over ten years. That's my offer. It's non-negotiable, and I want my money. What are you talking about? You keep playing dumb with me, and you're going to be counting dead hostages flying through these windows. You have my envelope. Inside are Cayman Island accounts and bearer bonds. You will transfer the monetary value of those bonds into those accounts. Two million dollars. Once the transfer is complete, I will release two hostages in good faith. One million dollars a life, I'd say that's a good deal. Back home, I was no one. Nothing. My wife walked out on me. I lost my job, my apartment. Couldn't pay the bills. People walked all over me. Because they could. Because they like it! When you are afraid. So now it's my turn. When I was fired, when they took away my apartment, they all said... It's nothing personal. It's just the times. Well, it's nothing personal, Captain. It's just the times. Long time no see, Burke. <laughs> Would you like to know what's out there, Burke? Would you like to know what's on the other side? You know what prisoners hate more than anything else, Burke? Huh? Prisoners hate cops more than anything else. Every killer in this prison is going to know who you are. You're not going to know when it's coming. Let him go. Bring me a dream, Burke. Bring me a dream. In this conversation, Patrick Kilpatrick and I run the gamut of his career and discuss his craft in the world of acting. We also discuss his approach to playing villains and other assorted character actors and his production company, Uncommon Dialogue Films. Kilpatrick also tells us about his memoir, Dying for Living, Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot, Volume 1. In this memoir, Kilpatrick opens up and tells about his upbringing and the paths that led him into the film business. We also chat his role in the film Blackwater, where he not only reunited with Jean-Claude Van Damme as the antagonist, but also battled Dolph Lundgren on a top-secret submarine. It should also be noted that Patrick Kilpatrick is entering the world of politics, where he's currently running for the governorship of California. Clearly, Kilpatrick is a man of many talents who is constantly working in a variety of capacities. He is also extremely generous and kind, and absolutely nothing like the intimidating villains he's portrayed numerous times on screen. Please be sure to check out Patrick Kilpatrick's website, as well as his book, Dying for Living, Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot. Volume 2 is also on the way, so be sure to be on the lookout for that as well. 
So, without further ado, is my conversation with Patrick Kilpatrick on I Must Break, this podcast. I did pick up your book, though, uh, a few weeks back, actually. But yeah, no, you were at the, uh, you were at the Tattered Cover in Denver, and that's, that's an establishment that I've frequented uh, quite a bit. But it was one of those things where when I, uh, when I saw that I missed you by just a couple months, I was like, oh, man, I would have loved to get a picture with you as well. But uh, anyway, maybe next time when uh, Volume 2 comes out, huh? Yeah, Volume 2, I'm, you know, I'm very blessed. Um, I'm acutely aware that COVID was not fun for a lot of people economically, but for us, I got hired to do a big Asian-themed action thriller just as it broke to write and produce it. And uh, we took the money from that and elevated everything we're, we were doing a whole slew of projects. Then we just got hired for another one. So I've been really busy with screenwriting and, and uh, producing. Um, and so feel tremendously blessed. And, and, of course, now we're running for the governorship of California because there's a recall. So uh, a lot going on. Um, and, of course, California is very challenged. So... Uh, it's almost like an urgent situation to get out there and get a change of leadership here. A lot of good people running. Well, I mean, I, I, have, I have to be perfectly honest. I mean, it is an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And I think it's safe to say that you've been scaring the crap out of me on screen for well over 30 years. So if I sound slightly intimidated, uh, I, I do apologize. But, man, you've, you've gone toe-to-toe with, if we just run down the list, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Bruce Willis, Steven Seagal, Tom Cruise. I mean, and, and you live to talk about it. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, I was very uh, blessed when I was 17 years old. I had a, a really bad car accident, and I couldn't play sports, um, and I, was, I almost didn't walk again. But as a result of that, I got into healing modalities like massage and chiropractory and acupuncture. And so I learned how to put myself back together uh, with very balanced exercise. And so when I, and I also became a writer. So when I got back to acting or found my way to acting 10 years later, I had the mind of a writer and the body of an athlete. And I, 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 I had all of this skill set so I could put myself back together very quickly after, you know, fighting Jean-Claude for 18 hours a day at weeks at a time or whatever it was. So, um, and I was always physical. So they were, there was always some, pretty much always a physical component to whatever you were doing. Well, yeah, like I was saying, I mean, I, I picked up a copy of your book. I've really enjoyed reading it. Um, congratulations on, uh, on telling these stories about your overall upbringing and the early days of your career. You know, the, the one thing that, that I noticed about it that, I mean, I noticed quite a few things about it, but I have to give you major kudos and major props because, I mean, you told some, some real stories from your, from your past that I imagine, you know, reliving those and telling those may not have been super easy. Was it, I mean, is it fair to say, have you been able to use those experiences from your past to kind of help hone your craft in the, in the field of acting? Oh yeah, of course. Well, you're always using that kind of thing. Um, what comes to mind instantly was the death of my father, which of course was, a, uh, my father was an extraordinary man. And, and uh, you know, you, that's kind of what an actor does. You mine the emotional uh, landscape. And for example, doing X-Files, and I had to play this challenge, serial killer, romantic challenge, serial killer, really, and who was in love with a woman. And so I just would think about my father's passing. And, of course, that along with slamming my hand into a bumper a chrome bumper in between shots would give my eyes the the requisite emotional pain and um, loss that was required for the job. So yeah, that's kind of part of the part of the game. I sometimes make fun. You know, I see an actress or an actor crying, and I go, "Go ahead, think of your dead granny." You know, 
because that's really what's going on sometimes. For some people, it's their pets. Or I mean, I had lived a lot before I got to acting, so I'm grateful for that. Well, I mean, clearly you've made a name for yourself, you know, playing villains in film. And, I mean, my God, <laughs> you, you've proven that you can do it real well uh, playing the bad guy and the heavy. When was it that you discovered that this was your niche, that this was your forte, that you not only could play a bad guy, but you could play one scary, menacing, memorable bad dude? Well, you know, one of the reasons I wrote that book was try to, to try to discover – for myself, how this all began. And uh, after I had finished the book, I suddenly had this insight that when I was in first grade, uh, my class did the Pied Piper of Hamlin, and they made me the villain mayor. So in first grade, whatever that energy, I think it was an exuberance, a mischievousness, a sort of hyper athletic uh, energy that kind of translated. I did play good guys, and I have played good guys. Um, so I don't really feel. I think just the playing villains thing is partly institutional typecasting, which happens to everybody out here, no matter what you're playing, unless you really fight against it. And I didn't fight against it. I had a family to rear and shepherd through college, and I just wanted to keep working. And I kept waiting for them to give me the good guy, but they never really did. And But that happens to a lot of me. If you look at Rucker Hauer, Rucker Hauer started out as a heroic leading man, and then he did The Hitcher, and um, he did such a superb job it was forever before he got out of it. And, of course, he did Blade Runner, so, um, which is an ultimate bad guy. So, um, I mean, I've been cast playing the president of the United States. That, that movie hasn't gotten its funding, so it's not really like I can only play. I'm very fortunate now because in the independent films, they're really happy to have me on any level, and so they kind of say whatever you want to play. Um, so the villain stuff is very rich terrain, so it's, it's been a good life and I've enjoyed it. And it was a way to keep working and keep, uh, playing with really good people and all of that. So, um, I look forward to playing a lot of good guys. I look for things that are actually challenging that I haven't done before. Of course, if you get the same part with the same language of villainy, you can always do something new with it. So the trick becomes to come up with something new. And, of course, I think you do get better at it because I'm always exploring what is going to make this villain. I always think if I can arouse people as well as scare them, then I've succeeded. Um, and I love improv so... I'm often able to improv really well and have fun with that and be verbal. You probably surmised already that I'm relatively verbal. <laughs> well, that was actually, it's funny you mentioned that because that was actually the, the thing that I find really fascinating, okay? So say, for example, you, you played a mercenary in Under Siege 2, and then you showed up as, uh, as one of the heavies in Eraser against Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the thing that I found really interesting, I mean, you're, you're a consummate professional, but in each of these roles, it seems like you are making a conscious decision at differentiating these roles apart from one another. I mean, is, is, is that fair to say? Yes. Um, sometimes they don't always succeed, like Last Man Standing and re Replacement Killers. It wasn't my first intention to be the first guy dying in those two movies back to back, but um, they came to me at Replacement Killers and said, oh my God, our biggest market is Asia, and we realized uh, we've killed off everybody who's Asian and you're still alive at the end of the movie. So they flipped the parts uh, between myself and an, uh, an actor named Lee, who had played my 
second guy in a couple of movies, so I was very happy for him. So, um, yeah, I try to create something different, either through wardrobe or dialect or mannerisms uh, with everybody. That's the, that's what makes it stimulating and fun. Well, the the other thing that I find really interesting, I mean, this is that <laughs> there's there's so many things that I that I just find fascinating about you know the the craft of acting, but you know it's funny looking at uh, at a film like Death Warrant where you played the the Sandman, and actually I watched uh, another film that you did a couple weeks back, um, The Substitute Four, where you played like this uh, white supremacist leader of a of a military school, and I imagine, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but I imagine playing roles like these can, I mean, they have to play a psychological toll on you. You know, I mean, do you have methods or techniques that you employ to kind of separate your craft from the real Patrick Kilpatrick? I actually think that inability to separate the craft of it is something that only really happens in the very beginning. I mean, there's a famous story about Sir Lawrence Olivier and, he could do Hamlet, and he could be telling a dirty joke on the side of the off stage, and step out and do Hamlet. So, as you go along, you become very adept at clicking a button and going into the character. I don't really take these things home with me; it's just playing. I think if there's any psychological damage that comes from playing them. Well, let me step back. I mean, I did a play in New York, and I was the reason that everything bad happened night after night after night after night after night after week. That can get on you. And occasionally, I would actually go to the back of the theater and have a good cry. And it sounds like, but to sort of cleanse myself of it. Um, but as far as movie stuff goes, you know, I... I I click out of it pretty, pretty pretty, readily. And also, you have to remember, these guys are actually having fun while they're playing these very vile people. It's not like they're not having a good time. I think the trick, the, the thing that separates movie villainy from real life is often the sense of fun of it. It's the sense of play of it. The sense of sensuality to it. Now, one of the greatest villain things I ever saw was Robert Duvall in something called Citizen X. He played a, a Russian serial killer. And the thing that was so unique about that character was he was so boring, which is really interesting uh, that Robert Duvall did that so skillfully. I don't know that I'm arriving at anything for you here, but I, I'm just saying I have fun playing at acting no matter what it is. I have a lot of fun with the wardrobe. I have a lot of fun with the improvisation of it. And I have a lot of fun with um, the dialects. Um, so it's play acting. I mean, I'm getting ready to do a Western. It's a whole other thing, you know. <laughs> Speaking of wardrobe, I mean, that's, that's interesting you mentioned that because, yeah, looking at a, at a film like Under Siege 2, I'll always remember your mercenary in particular because your mercenary is wearing that really cool hat, you know what I mean, <laughs> like throughout the film. I loved that, that touch. Well, uh, I'll share with you how that arrived. That was probably the most incomplete script of, at a studio level I've ever seen in my life. I mean, literally... We started filming, and there was nothing there. And so what do you do when that circ when you have, you don't even have names. You have mercenary one, two, three, four, five. So you, you need to find something that doesn't unbalance the rest of the movie, but also separates you out of the pack on some level. And often wardrobe is something that does that. You take a, a little movie like Three Ninjas, Knuckle Up, with it, which was my kids' favorite movie because when they were growing up, because a dad was getting beaten up by a bunch of little kids. So, <laughs> um, but I prowled Western stores to come up with these crazy shirts and 
vaquero jackets and stuff because it took place on the border between Mexico and Texas. So, yeah, wardrobe is a key way that you can separate yourself out from it. That cap was all we had that I had. I immediately said, that'll make me stand out from the rest of the guys. Um, not to unbalance the script or the show, but to bring some originality to it. Um, I'm glad you appreciated that. Yeah. What are the things that scared you? What, <laughs> what are the things that scared me? Well, it's interesting. I mean, okay, yeah. Your, your villain in uh, Last Man Standing, I mean, you mentioned how you're the first one uh, to die, but, I mean, there, there's a certain uh, sense of uh, intimidation and intensity to you in that scene where, you know, you're talking to Bruce Willis, you know, through the car. I mean, and that was a scene, I mean, I, I have to believe that's why they played that scene in the trailer for that film because, I mean, that, you, that is so intense. And I mean, and this is a uh, very menacing and intimidating bad dude that you play in that film, even though your screen time is fairly uh, limited. Well, you know, I'm reminded by Jack Pallance, who won an Academy Award for a part that I don't, I think he was on there for about three minutes for Shane. So it's not the length of screen time, although Jack Nicholson said any, no actor worth his salt is going to take anything unless he's got three scenes to shine. Not yeah. really true, because I've done some television shows where I had only one scene, and I had a grand time. Um, you just do what you can with whatever you're given. You know, you take a big movie like Under Siege 2, and you got a lot, or Minority Report, you've got a lot of moving parts. You've got a lot of headliners. You've got... You've got really good quality actors uh, all around. So you make gold out of whatever you have and try to stretch the boundaries of whatever. I'm always looking at a scene and what can I do to make this memorable. And, um, and sometimes I call it paradox performing or paradox advertising taking it in the opposite direction from what the actual script indicates. Um, the master of that was Marlon Brando. Um, he would do things completely in opposition to what the, the script read, and yet it worked brilliantly. You know, it'll say he cries. Well, he wouldn't cry. He would laugh. Um, so... I think fine actors often look to go in the opposite direction from the text while honoring the writer and the project. So, Well, I wanted to ask you quickly about the film Blackwater. I mean, this is a cool little movie where here you got to square off against both Jean-Claude Van Damme and Dolph Lundgren. With uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, you were able to... Uh, reunite with him again which which i thought was really kind of cool seeing on screen because you know here you are reuniting with him again from death warrant where you know that that particular film came out where you guys were both relatively early in your in your careers what was it like uh what was it like uh sharing the uh the scene with him again uh all those years later well it was meaningful because of that um and whatever you might call the ravages of time um it was also meaningful, really profoundly for me, because a lot of the movie took place on the USS Alabama, because we shot at Mobile. And the USS Alabama was one of the battleships that provided cover for my father in World War II, uh, because he was an underwater demolition team guy, and the battleships would pull up and... <laughs> um, bombard the islands out in the Pacific, and then the UDT guys would swim in and blow up the obstacles. So for me, um, and it happened right when my father was passing, and uh, so that was memorable for me. What was it like as far as Jean-Claude goes? Well, I have a lot of that in the second volume. Um, it was a crazy shoot, and... Um, what can I say? I think Jean-Claude's kind of a tragic figure. Um, he remains very powerful as a distribution force, but um, 
you'll have to read my book about that one. I don't want to. Okay. I'm feeling really good about life and everything, but I, I love Jean Claude. He has a good heart, but he's been through so much that actually I uh, he's managed to hurt himself a lot. So um, it was tragic. I mean, you don't really end up acting with Jean Claude a lot. You know, because you're doing it with the stunt coordinator or something else. I mean, that sounds like I'm being terribly negative. I'm not. I'm actually being journalistic about what's going on. And it's, it's not a... Because a lot of people, I think, care about him. And the truth is, uh, he, he's a bit ravaged by his excesses by now. And my heart goes out to him, and I hope he gets it together. Well, the, the one thing I will say about Blackwater is that I, I feel like, <laughs> kind of like with Last Man Standing, actually, I feel like you leave the film a little too early, and that was my biggest noticing, I guess, when I first saw it, is that you leave the film so early that, as a result, the movie almost kind of loses its threat and its stakes way too soon, you know, <laughs> after you, uh, after you uh, bow out of the film. So, and I think that's a testament to your, your overall presence and intensity on, on screen. Well, I appreciate you saying that. In that movie, it was by calculation. They were really looking to shock people um, that were not expecting for me to exit. <laughs> so, um, uh, Alan Unger, well, it's a weird movie, too, because... Um, Alan Unger was the director, but he's not wasn't allowed to put his name on the movie um, because he had a contract with some other. Film. So it's the director is listed, the DP is listed as the director. But Alan, I loved, and he was, you know, he hired Al Sapienza and I because uh, he wanted some pros to come in, and I, I think Al's a great fun actor as well, and. So onward and upward. <laughs> it's always well, to stay on the screen longer, but sometimes for the purposes of uh, narrative, you don't. <laughs> so what did Lee Marvin say? He said, every time I come on the screen, you know I'm not going to get the girl and I'm going to get a cheap funeral. So that's basically the deal. Well, I would be remiss if I did not ask you about Steven Seagal, and it seems like everybody who has ever worked with Mr. Seagal always has a Steven Seagal story, and I don't know if you're at liberty to, to tell any, but do, do you by chance have a, a Steven Seagal story that uh, you might be able to enlighten me with? <laughs> I have a bunch of them. They're in, my, in volume two of the book. Um, Steven is an interesting figure because, you know, of all the guys, and I've I haven't been opposite Jet Li or, or Sylvester Stallone, but of all of the martial arts guys, um, he's probably the most deadly um, in real life. Um, I mean, he, at the time we did Under Siege 2, he's very much a shooter, you know, and I, sh I shoot recreationally and Although in the last couple of years I've been so busy screenwriting, exhilarated by it that I really haven't gone shooting a lot. But he's a really powerful shooter, and he knows a lot of deadly martial arts. So he can. You don't really act with Stephen, at least then. I, I, I mean, I haven't well, worked with Stephen since I do suits too. But he would fly in uh, on his helicopter. You remember my character really doesn't interact with him. Uh, I'm more interacting with pr the pursuit of him. And, um, and then my boss, Everett McGill. So um, I never really, I got along with Stephen really well, but we would do stuff like, I would say, where do you get speedo briefs, Stephen? And he would, because I'd be teasing, you know, and, uh, and he would give me a little stone that he had found in the landscape that was in the shape of a heart. <laughs> so there were all these little, the funny, I mean, I got to tell you, Sean, that was the best 
fun job because you had every stunt guy on the planet on the movie. And they are the most ribald, irreverent people. And Stephen and his bodyguards, who were these policemen from Telluride, Colorado, who I knew, would try to run the set by intimidation. And it just doesn't work with guys who like stunt guys. And it doesn't work with New York actors or L.A. actors like Peter Green and and Eric Bogosian and myself, you know. So um, it was just, you know, and it was such a great job because you could be the take the garbage out on that movie and you'd have three University of Colorado, Colorado co-eds to go out with every night. And, and we were all getting paid a lot of money. And it was in Colorado in the, in the fall in Vail, the most beautiful time of the year. And we're out in the wilderness on this train, uh, or Warner Brothers. And I love Jeff Murphy. What genius there is in Under Siege 2 is Jeff Murphy is responsible for the director, who, um, and the experience was so painful that it almost destroyed his career. And then he went back to Australia or New Zealand, I think New Zealand or Australia, wherever he's from, to, and he became, he had a whole career as the second unit director of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Brilliant director. If you think about that movie now, it's one of the first movies where there's seven or eight things going on at once, and they're all cut together. And it, it's now that kind of thing is standard operating procedure. But then, nobody had really done that before. Um, the other thing about Stephen, which I found remarkable, was I asked him to do a fight with both of us having automatic weapons in each hand, and then uh, so we could do that and have machine gun. Because I'm always trying to pick the artistic flag up and take it further. Well, he wouldn't do it with me, and I never really understood why. It's a weird impulse you run into every now and then, that people don't want to go further. Um, in my script writing and our movies at Uncommon Dialogue Films, we try to always go further, to pick the artistic flag up and take it further. I, and I think particularly action audiences demand that, and they require it in action films. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't a dangerous gig because we could have put the machine gun fire in post-production, but for some reason he didn't want to do that. And I've always regretted that we didn't do that or have, have a knife in one hand and a machine gun in the other. So you can imagine the cyclical firepower that you could be getting going with that, um, this is why I had to get into doing my own films, because I found after a while certain limitations with some of the people that we worked with. Um, that sounds like I'm being negative. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I have a problem in my life, and it's, uh, I've wrestled with it all my life. Should I be the journalist, which I began as, and tell the truth as I see it, or should I be a spiritual person who says nothing, quote unquote, negative about anybody? And unfortunately, or fortunately, this journalist always wins out uh, in my, and I think you get that from my book. And volume two is all about show business. It's all about all of these jobs. And I, I tell whatever my truth is about those jobs. And it's a crazy, crazy world. And in, incomprehensible on some levels. Uh, whether you're talking about doing 24 or whether you're talking about uh, working with Steven Spielberg on Minority Report or Antoine Fuqua on Replacement Killers. Um, a lot of incomprehensible and bizarre things happen on these movies. I mean, you talked about Blackwater. It was just a bizarre set of circumstances. Um, that mixed in with the fact that you have the most beautiful beaches in the world down on the Gold Coast, 
of Alabama, and the people are really rich, and the food is extraordinary, and wonderful experience. But I'm largely acting with a C-stand with a smiley face on it, because Jean-Claude won't come out of his trailer. <laughs> what can I tell you? There's yeah. billions. This is why I have to write books, because you haven't got a place to put all these stories. Well, I, you know, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed reading uh, Volume One, and I really do appreciate you taking the time to to chat with me. I mean, obviously, I could, uh, <laughs> I, I find your career fascinating, so I could go through every film. But I know that you're very, very busy. You're constantly, like I said, busy in the realms of uh, acting, producing, uh, coaching, public speaking, and now politics. Which, uh, congratulations. On that, is there is there anything else that uh, that that you're working on, or uh, where can we follow you and uh, for your next yeah. adventures? Yeah, I mean, my company, Uncommon Dialogue Films, uh, we spend a lot of times now pumping material into the streaming services, um, doing funding meetings with high net worth individuals and uh, entities. Um, we spend a lot of time crafting. It's a team approach. I'm very lucky. I've got a terrific team that I work with, Maria Semambalova and uh, my lovely wife, Heidi Bright, and uh, Raffaello and Jeff, these guys. Um, I'm very lucky. We have a great team. We put together uh, our films and our projects and wonderful clients who, bought, I mean, I'll share with you something that's so extraordinary. Recently, we just got the funding, and they didn't tie it to anything. They just said, do whatever you want. And I said, Bob's your uncle, man. I'm, I, I, I'm living the dream. So um, we've got a, a, a big uh, crime thing coming out uh, set in the world of, I'm not going to tell you anything further, <laughs> but... Okay. Um, I'm very excited about what's coming ahead. We have a number of really great projects coming. And so, uh, God willing, we'll be doing a lot of quality work for people out there in the global universe for a long time to come. So, And I have two lovely boys, and I can't tell you how happy I am about that, 29 and 24. So, And a beautiful woman that I'm married to, so I'm doing very, very, very well. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. I mean, you, you're a great guy. You don't uh, you don't scare the crap out of me anymore. So thank you very, very much. Well, you know, I, I'm really tickled pink when I, I don't know how old you are, but I get young people to come up and they'll say something like, oh, my God, you're like my nightmare fantasy. And just for a second, they can't separate the reality from the the fantasy that they've grown up with. Probably your parents shouldn't have let you see those movies when you were growing up. But no, I'm I'm 38. Yeah, I'm 38. So I I grew up on your films when I probably shouldn't have been watching them. But um, uh, much better than the stuff they're producing nowadays, in my opinion. So hopefully that the things that we come out with from Uncommon Dialogue Films, you'll say, no, this is ranks. Look, I am moved and inspired by people like Steven Spielberg and. Antoine Fuqua and, and uh, Ridley Scott and Tony Scott. And there's a lot of great people doing great, great work out there. There is a lot of dreck, but there's also a lot of people doing extraordinary stuff. And so we're happy to just be playing in that realm with them. So onward and upward, my friend. Volume 2 comes back. I hope to be able to come back and speak with you. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. Thank you.